Welcome everybody to the Empower Coffee Break with uh, Empower Coaching's uh, Mary Brody here on uh, on our controls today, and me, I'm Dana Theus, founder and CEO of Empower Coaching, and today we're covering an Empower Women subject, women in history. Um, seems right after our historical holiday here in the U.S. That's appropriate. And we cover topics uh, of women in the workplace typically, but also people in the workplace and what it takes to build the kind of workplace that you want to work in, surviving and thriving in the workplace. Um, so we hope you join us every Tuesday at 1 o'clock here for our half-hour discussion. This uh, Today we don't have a guest, so we have a couple of open seats, and we'd invite you to come in and join us for the discussion uh, and or chat. Uh, we'd be happy to take questions or comments or thoughts via chat. Um, and uh, you can always find uh, past episodes and upcoming topics. We do have a lot of guests coming up uh, at coffeebreak.inpower.com coaching.com. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mary to talk about um, why she chose the subject of women in history, given that Women's History Month was like two, three months ago. <laughs> and also, um, what I mean, she's been doing a lot of research on this topic. My, my personal interest is in a slightly different direction, which we'll get to later. But um, I'm really wondering, Mary, like, okay, why was this up for you? And you obviously know something about women's history. So you like took a new look at it or you went deeply into it? What'd you find this time? Well, yeah, so I find it interesting how, because history is always written by the victor, right? And usually the victor are men, right? And so women do contribute in history and we're told a lot of times like, oh, it's new to have women leaders. Well, when you start reading history and start going into it, not so much. <laughs> women leaders have been around a long, long time. Um, it's just different in, you know, different ways they've led or different ways they've contributed. And we're not always told that side of history. So I always find it fascinating um, how we'll hear about certain big historical events, but we don't necessarily hear about what were what were women's roles at that time. And so um, that's where, you know, being the 4th of July and coming from New England, right? It's like, it's all about, especially because I grew up near Plymouth too, so it makes it even worse, right? So it's all about like, oh my God, like, you know, the whole colonial thing. I swear to God, I learned more revolutionary war history than I'd ever care to admit. Um, but you know, we never, we never really heard about the women, right? So we'd hear about Martha Washington and her supportive role and Abigail Adams, who had a far bigger role than really people talk about. Mm -hmm. And um, then, you know, we'd hear about Paul Revere's ride, we'd see the Paul, you know, go to Boston and do the Freedom Trail, see the Paul Revere's house. But we never hear about some of these other things that that occurred. And that's where I'm like, well, there has to be some whole thing about what did the women contribute. And um, I researched a piece a while back, but I haven't fully done anything with it. And it was more around like Thanksgiving holiday about Native American and women, Native American history and women. And what role did, because um, it was more dependent on the different tribes and all of that, right? They, they didn't all have the same role, but women had a much more active role. And, you know, when people first came from Europe, to um, to this area, they were like, wait a minute, you make your women do all this work in the village? Isn't that horrible? <laughs> and that's not the way their system worked. They just didn't understand, like there was just a complete miscommunication between the two. Um, and they also didn't understand that women had such an active role in a in the villages, right? They just didn't, they just didn't get that. And I think that is a contributing factor with some of the Revolutionary War history. So that's why I was like fascinated. I'm like, so what happened? and what was going on. And so I did a little Google search and I came up with some interesting <laughs> little factoids that you would never guess of what went on. So um, so let me ask this, because there are so many stories about women in history that come out, yeah. you know, like, oh, look, we didn't know women did this, that, and the other, because your, your point is right. right. We, you know, history is written by the victors and, and even, even more, I mean, it's 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 written. It's written by the victors to make sense in hindsight of the vic right. of, of the victors' view, right? But right. I think that the piece that is interesting to me is nowadays we talk about unconscious bias, and so obviously all of the you know all of history is written with a lot of unconscious bias. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, like. And, 
uh, I heard the other day uh, someone being interviewed about the role of um, former slaves in creating Southern cooking and uh, the original whiskey recipes, all kinds of stuff, you know, and, and obviously there was just tons of unconscious bias going on there, which is like, well, of course we get credit for all this, you know, we white people. <laughs> um, right. So I think the right. same thing is, is going on here. Uh, so when you look back at the stories that you've been researching, what is it that jumps out to you about, not so much about the women, but about the history that allowed their acts to be just glossed over and un unseen? Well, the big thing that stuck out for me was the role of women as spies. All right. And I found that to be fascinating because the, the attitude was, well, you know, these women, they're kind of stupid and they're just sitting around in these parlors doing their embroidery, knitting, whatever jazz. Um, what do they know? Right. And um, they use that to their advantage, which I was like, seriously, like that's it's kind of cool. Um, they had code words to keep some of their um, identities anonymous, um, which would make sense. You know, if someone is. Um, a spy and let's say their husband's a royal, a loyalist, right? What are you going to, what are you going to do? Right. You don't really want to come out <laughs> that you're listening to all this stuff. Um, and there were some spies who came out and alerted, um, like, I think I'm trying to remember which one I have to go look it up in notes, but, um, that alerted like about, um, Benedict Arnold's, um, treason and all this other stuff. It was like women doing this, right? Because they were in the parlor hanging out, doing the embroidery and there they go. <laughs> um, and we don't talk about it, right? We just talk about the acts that the men did. And we don't talk about also, I think, um, the role of, um, Native Americans, um, and what they, and their view of the Revolutionary War, which I got into a little bit because there was an active role. They had a different view of women. Um, and so, and again, this was a more tribe by tribe basis. Um, and I don't like to use the word tribe because I don't see, we, like to use it. But anyway, it's, it's like there's no other better word, so I'll just phrase it that way. But their groups, um, they, um, I think they don't, um, they don't necessarily see women as the subservient view, I think, that sometimes they had in Western Europe. So they saw like women um, ruled the, like inside the village, right? And the men, dealt with issues outside the village and they would come together to like, they might, and the women would choose the men who led. Like in some cases, that's how they would structure um, how their government. And um, so women had a lot to say, right? Um, you know, and the Europeans came over, they didn't get it. They just saw women working very actively. Like they didn't understand that women working in the, in the village and doing all the stuff with the food, like basically the women were managing the food supply to the West, to the Europeans, though, they didn't see it that way. <laughs> they just no, didn't well, get it. And, and you know what, there's an argument that that's still the case. You know, women manage most of the household financials, including the food supply. Right, <laughs> right, um, right. And, and don't really, I mean, I don't want to say they don't get credit for it. There's an awful lot of advertising aimed at women's control of the pocketbook. <laughs> um, but well, I don't know that they get the respect for it. Exactly. Yes. They don't get the respect for what that role is. And they did um, in the Native, because I think the Native Americans had um, a rather big, large role in the Revolutionary War. And in some cases, they did not go along with the colonists. They wanted the colonists out of there because they were like, these people, you know, what the hell, right? What are they doing to our land? Um, and some of them, though, were like, okay, so lesser of two evils argument. Like, we've got these Brits who lie to us all the time. <laughs> Right. We don't like them. We don't like these colonists much either. But, you know, at least they don't lie. <laughs> we got that going and we're kind of coexisting with them so we can make it work. Um, but then there was also this larger influence, I think, of um, what of what the Brits brought and their relationships even within um, within what was that early nation. Right. And, that, and how did that all work? It's kind of complicated. It's very intriguing. It's always complicated. You know, something you said, uh, I'm going to bring it back a little bit to unconscious bias, I think is really important yeah. um, because I remember reading just recently talking about women spies. The first woman who was the, in the CIA was a, um, she was in the U.S. Embassy. I don't remember her name. She was in the U.S. Embassy and 
she was a CIA spy doing what you're talking about, just listening in on these conversations in yeah. um, former Soviet Union. Former Soviet Union, and and nobody thought she could possibly be, you know, a spy because yeah. women were just there, right? Yeah. Right. And you know, we hear these stories over and over of these kind of exceptional women who break the molds, and you know, everything from Annie Oakley, to, <laughs> you yeah. know, sharpshooter, um, Madame Curie, you know, th there's mathematicians, everything. And it's interesting to me how, so we say, wow, this woman was wonderful. And she was, you know, she made history. Right. Um, on the other hand, it's like, it's sort of like when you say, um, or not you, but you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, my best friend's a woman. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sexist. My, you know, I have daughters <laughs> or I'm not a racist. I have a good friend who's black <laughs> or Indian. Right. You know, right. You know. And, and the thing right. is, is when we call out individuals and say she was, you know, she was exceptional, it's kind of like, and, and as opposed to all those other women, or as opposed to all those other people who we know aren't as exceptional. And, and I have, I, I personally have always had a, a slight cognitive dissonance about, you know, Black History Month and Women's History Month and all these things for calling calling out these special individuals just to prove, you know, well, they're not, they're not all stupid. Um, when in fact, you know, that it, we, we tend to want to make that distinction. These people are so great, unlike the rest of them. And and I don't think it's fair of me or anybody else, but I, I just think it's weird how we think that way sometimes. Um, that if we recognize an individual, it, it, it allows us off the hook for kind of ignoring everybody else. Does that make any sense? <laughs> it does, it does. Cause that's where I think what I find fascinating about the agent 355 is that there were a number of them and they had to keep their identity sealed, right? Because of, you know, but they, but there were a number of people who were in agent 355. They were spoken about like 355 all over the place. Um, makes you wonder how many women did contribute um, to the war effort and the ones that are mentioned versus the ones who are who might have done something quite significant and doesn't don't go down in history in the same way. Kind of like um, my new favorite, Civil Ludington, who did the Paul Revere ride, right, or a similar type of ride at like fifteen or sixteen, some jazz like that. Yes, um, but yeah. we don't talk about her, right? You know? So who else did a ride that maybe we don't hear about, or they might have done something? Because you have a good point, right? Like. We don't hear about all of the, all of that. Well, to be fair, we don't hear about a lot of the other Paul Revere's, you know, the males either. There's yeah. just, there's yeah. just so much room in our collective history um, for these people. But, uh, but it. I, so, we also didn't have an internet either, but anyway. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they couldn't blog about it. They, if they, you know, if like their, their diary got toast, like literally. <laughs> Yeah. But anyway, sorry, I interrupted. <laughs> I just couldn't. I had to, I had to share that. Well, and the other thing I was thinking, um, did you happen to see um, the movie about Alan Turing? No, I did not. Ah, uh, okay. Um, I'm forgetting the name of it right now. Uh, it just came out like a year or two ago. Anyway, it was interesting. So it was about him, and he was gay, and that was you know part of the whole of his whole story. Uh, but like his right hand person was a mathematician who was a woman uh, who, who played a very important role, um, you know, in the actual, you know, the, the technical aspects of what they were doing was also kind of emotionally being his uh, emotional and intellectual partner through the whole thing. And her role was amazing, uh, but definitely second fiddle. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and so it wasn't really played up as a partnership. And I always wondered, you know, if I weren't quite so lazy, I'd love to go back and do a lot of research on, you know, what what was her real role in that? And was she really kind of a second fiddle or, or was, was she more of a true partner? Um, well, you bring up the, the, I think, kind of a bit of the Abigail Adams, right? And John yeah, Adams yeah. and um, how much of an influence did she have on him? Um, and how many ideas of hers were really used. And I think there's a bit of that too with Martha and George Washington, um, you know, the, the influence, but you know, you can't, women just don't do that then. Right. Um, <laughs> it's well, the, it's the man. And, and, and to be, to be fair to, 
to the couple, so to speak. I know so many women in business who are who especially who want to be second fiddle. They want to be the right hand person. They want to be the vice president, not the president or the assistant director or not the director. And um, they're very comfortable in that secondary role where they won't have to get the um, criticism and the barbs and the arrows and, you know, take on the risks of being the one who's going to be the voice for those kind of ideas. And I think that we see that in history through the people that we're talking about here. Um, and knowing those women individually, I can't blame them. I mean, you know, you, you rise to the top, you get slings and arrows just thrown at you because you're at the top. It almost doesn't matter uh, what you have to say. Um, and then I think if you rise up to the top as a woman, you get a whole bunch of other, you know, crap <laughs> just because you're a woman. Um, and, and, and trying to, you know, be influential at that level. So from an individual standpoint, I don't always, you know, blame the woman for not wanting to take that on. Cause it's a, it's, it's not fun. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, yeah, I, I think today there has been, um, progress for women to be in a more leadership position. Um, I don't think it was necessarily possible unless you were like royalty um, back way back in the, in the revolutionary war days. Um, Cause even then Elizabeth the first had, she had a rough time going, you know, just a hundred years before then, um, you know, had to really prove a lot of things um, to keep her, to keep her throne. Um, same with Mary queen of Scots too. She had to do, she was crazy though, but anyway. <laughs> Hey, women can be as great there. as men, right? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, she was, yeah. <laughs> and and it, it is interesting, though. That, I mean, that's the European lineage. You know, when we look back over, and even today, I mean, I remember seeing this meme recently, which was like, you know, showing all the heads of state who were women, who have been women over the, you know, the last 50 to 100 years, except for here. <laughs> and, you know, right, Margaret I Thatcher made it up there, but... Uh, but overall, it's in some places, it's a lot easier to be in leadership as a woman than it is in our culture. Well, was it in Africa? There's three women leading African mm -hmm. nations at the moment. And in Africa, there's also a view of women leading. And again, it goes based on region because there's some parts where women, they don't even have league. They Like, what is it? There was a case. I think it was, I don't want to say it wrong. It might have been Moses. I don't know, maybe not Mozambique, but anyway, can't, one of the countries, right? I have to go look it up, but um, they just recently got the right to sue their husband for not managing the family coffers very well. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, imagine that. Yeah, and they couldn't sue their husband. So apparently this husband was uh, like messing up the family, right? And he was <laughs> not spending money well and just really screwing up. She had enough. And she sued and she didn't win. She should have won, but she didn't win because women couldn't sue. It was a breakthrough case for that country because a woman could sue. And then you get a country like Rwanda who where the men used to rule, but because of the devastating atrocities in that country, right? Now, 70% of the leaders are women, mm -hmm. right? So they've got a whole different view. And then you got Pakistan, which, you know, you wonder with a Muslim country, how do they have a woman role? And they did. Yeah. Same way well, you think like Malaysia and Indonesia, right? They got women in charge. Yeah. I, I, yes. I mean, which is, which isn't to say that it's standard yet. <laughs> and there's a lot of uh, family, you know, in, in a lot of countries, the, the family dynasty is yeah. more accepted than it is here. Although, you know, we have a Clinton running. <laughs> um, and, and I think there's that actually some people don't like her for that reason. You know, is, is it the family dynasty thing and we don't want any more dynasties? Um, well, Bush, Bush proved that, right? We have we got right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we won't go there. This is, this is women's history. Know, yeah. 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 We're going women history and try to stay revolutionary. <laughs> so, so I want to, I want to, I want to shift the conversation a little bit from the standpoint that I, you know, so history is telling the story of our past in a way that, makes it make sense to us, you know, that, that like the victors get to tell the story about why they were right. right. Um, right. But I think even, even for 
historians who are trying to do the right thing and codifying, you know, what happened and what can we learn from it? You have to make sense of things that fundamentally don't make sense in some cases. You know, you don't have all the information you need. So it's, right. in many ways, it is telling a story. I think of and, and to learn history, sometimes we have to tell a story just to get it to make sense in our heads. And one of the things that is interesting to me um, when I think about women's place in society and women in leadership and how well women are accepted and understood in leadership is when we look at our real stories, you know, our mythologies, um, of which history is a version, <laughs> you know, and, and you look at the you look at the stories we tell and the role that men and women play in the in the in the purely fiction. Uh, it's in some ways it's not that different than our real history, you know. Uh, the 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 kings and leaders of our myths and stories tend to look a lot like our real, you know, leaders. Uh, so right. one of the things that's interesting to me when when I look at you know women, true uh, heroines in our history is you know why is it so hard to, to get mythical stories about them, movies made about them, and um, you know to get them into our mythology yeah. so that it could be better we would we would find it less odd that you know a woman was a spy in, <laughs> in the revolutionary war <laughs> i know i know i think this goes to um you're bringing up an interesting point because then um, i might go down a weird or what you might be seen as a weird road but um how we do have gaps in how in history in general and how we teach history um where it takes a very definitive path and they're like you can look at um like when we start world history, right? We start with Egypt and then suddenly Africa has no more history, right? Who knows what happened there? There had to have been a history, but we don't know. <laughs> and then we go off to the Middle East and then suddenly Greece happens. And so apparently nothing happens over in the Middle East anymore, right? India, who has claimed like we've got 40,000 years of history, the Brits came in and said, no, you don't. You got a thousand, two thousand. It's about it, right? <laughs> so what happened over there? Who knows, right? Say with China, they've got thousands of years. Who knows, right? So we've got this whole like, <laughs> there's a path of history we get taught. And I think it's, it, it's traditionally, and I'm, I'm very like thankful it's opening up now that people are saying, hey, there's more history than what we've been told. Um, you know, like all of a sudden we show up in this, this um, in, in North America, right? The Europeans showed up, but before then the Africans were there, like other people were there. Um, you know, like there was, I, I saw this um, show that was um, saying that I guess they found remains of um, like human remains and they did the research, they did the DNA testing and it was, they were from Africa, right? But we don't, I think it's like opening up this narrative, which I think is a good thing and I hope they do more of because there's a lot of history that we've just, that's been shut out. And I think the women's side of it is part of, part of it. Um, and to open it up is a big it's a big deal in some respects. Yeah, and I think I I bring it back a little bit to unconscious bias, which is that, you know, like, well, those barbarians, you know, they didn't, the, the people in Africa didn't build pyramids. So we have, you know, this this magnificent uh, remains in Egypt that, that gets our imaginations going and, you know, power, what power it took to build those uh those pyramids and, you know, there was nothing like that going on in Africa. We just find some few bones, <laughs> you know, some, and yeah, which, which isn't really the case. Um, I was watching this guy, he was talking about, yeah, he was talking about, there's a civilization, I think in Ethiopia, like they found like all these tablets that they can't translate. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, like there's civilizations that like, we just don't understand, but we skip it. Yeah, and I guess you could argue that once upon a time, we didn't have very many, I mean, you only had so many books, you know, if you're a textbook company, right? It's like, we only have so many pages right. we can print. <laughs> and, and with the internet, right. that's not a limitation anymore. Um, but now we right. have the opposite. Well, we have it. Yeah, I think it is the opposite problem is it used to go through all these screens to get into, you know, had to be verified in one way or another to be a considered history. And now it's like we read a report <laughs> every day from paper in Florida about a dig. And, you know, it's like, okay, does, 
does that really count or is it someone trying to get headlines? It's very hard to screen that stuff. But I think that's why the popular mythology sometimes just takes over and it creates those headlines. You know, it's not the scientists creating the headlines, not that they're not biased either, but you know, there's a lot of head historic history is being rewritten by people in newsrooms trying to get some clicks. <laughs> I know. Yeah, there was a, actually an article this past weekend. I think it was um, in Wired about, um, and it, and it was pointing to what you're you're talking about about getting that that bit of truth. And I think it goes back to like facts, right? Like we don't revere facts anymore. Like with science, even some of these archaeological digs, right? They're supposed to be validated by like, you know, and that's where I think um, I was hearing this other thing too. I forget where it was, but um, like they do research, right? And you're supposed to have someone else validate this research, right? And, and it's not an exciting job. It's not very glamorous. Like you're just saying that whoever so-and-so, yes, it's true. They discovered this. Right? Isn't that nice? Um, and no one's doing it. So we get all these like initial papers coming out. No one's checking it. Yeah. No fact checking going on, right? And it's like, you know, and the same with um, when blogs get similar credibility as an article and articles get, they do get checked or someone is, else is reading it saying, hey, I don't think you can say that. I don't think that's true. Or they validate the links. You know, someone's doing some checking um, and that's been lost. I, I find it sad. <laughs> well, it hasn't, you know? it hasn't been lost. It's just not, it, we, the readers are less discerning. We don't say, oh, look, there's a fact check source and here's a not fact check source. And matter, matter of fact, we, the readers like to look at the ones that promote our view of reality. <laughs> And and say, well, that one's obviously true. You know, who cares if it's fact check? I mean, I don't know how many people have been telling me on my Facebook feed lately that, you know, just because PolitiFact says that, you know, this speech was was true doesn't mean it's really true. It's like, well, wow, if we don't if we don't believe the fact checkers anymore. We don't have any respect for the fact checkers and the facts, even if, you know, just because they're trying to distinguish it, then it did does point out how important our own beliefs are as to the reality we're creating. <laughs> well, yeah, because the the point, you know, it's well taken because you go to like uh, Wiki uh, Wikipedia and that's been up for debate as any truth in it. And there have been um, falsehoods in there um, based sure. on what people have entered and, you know, or things that aren't entirely 100 percent correct, um, which brings back the whole encyclopedia because it would be checked. Right. P or people right. would look it up. Um, I know I have be when I, before I will say anything in the news, I research stuff. Like I don't just read it once. Like I have to read it like three in three or four different perspectives. Right. So I read like all these different perspectives and then take, there's the fact and make sure it's in all of them. <laughs> Cause I don't, I want to be sure like what is really happening. Cause you can get these opinions and it's true with history, right? You can get all these different opinions of what, what transpired based on different people's perceptions. Um, and it's a perception. I don't like, I've read different perspectives of like the motivation behind the Revolutionary War. Some I'm like, mm. <laughs> some, oh, okay. That's, you know, that might be true, but some are definitely a, mm. <laughs> even the original narrative, some of it, I'm like, mm, I don't know. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, people people have their agendas, and and actually, yeah. that's neutrality is a nice objective, and our journalism and science, you know, strive for that. But they still have right. a perspective, they, even if they don't have an agenda all the time. They have a perspective. They have paradigms, you know, and like these are paradigms that screened out the contributions of women and slaves and people of color and other races, you know all the time. And that now we're realizing that and some people are using that as a reason to discredit them completely. They say, well, I don't believe anything they ever said, <laughs> which, which well, doesn't yeah. help because then we, we still don't have anything that objective. So. Yeah. I think there's still like the whole thing about fact, like someone did this, like to say, um, you know, like Sybil Ludington did this ride, right? Mm -hmm. She did it. Right. That's, Multiple things say she did it, she did it, right? Or um, so-and-so did this, right? And I think um, with, you know, there were women who did things in Revolutionary War history. Um, and, like, there were women who fought in the battlefield, 
right? There are a few who they say, actually, she fought or she helped so-and-so. Um, you know, um, I think we have to go back to more of that stuff happening. Like, then you can have a perspective on that, right? Like, did she get the credit she deserved? Did she have this? But she did it, right? And I don't think we talk enough about, like, this fact. We've lost the value of facts in this world. I, that, that's my take. <laughs> Somehow we went from women in history to... <laughs> right, to actually, what is history? Yeah. <laughs> what is history? You know, but actually, I had I, this was not my plan when we started this conversation, but I think that's actually a very uh, relevant wondering because I think that when we look at... We look at all the... As you said right when we started, we look at all the things history does not include that clearly happened. <laughs> Right. I mean, the right. story of history. And we really have to ask ourselves, how well do we understand history? And are we open to other interpretations that may not jive with what we're comfortable with or what we know um, or even what we value? Um, I think, you know, that's a conversation I wish more people were willing to have because um, it also casts current reality in a slightly different light if you if you do take that perspective. So I'm glad you do. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, because I do the whole, like the Victor wrote the history. So I'm always curious and I always do the research on let's what this other side, what happened to them, right? Like, mm -hmm. you know, yay, this happened, but what happened to this other side? What was their perspective? Because um, then you can start, I think when you start seeing the other side's perspective, you can start piecing some of the story together and how it might've, um, what might've happened, right? Um, maybe it, it wasn't as straightforward. That's where sometimes I'll hear the story of, um, you know, what happened, like the Native Americans perspective on the Revolutionary War. And it's so complicated and so convoluted. Some wanted the Brits out. Some wanted both of them out. Some, <laughs> you know, were like, where, let's just keep moving. <laughs> Get the hell away from these people. Um, and I, that I think a lot of a lot of that colored a lot of the colonists' view because they didn't fully understand the issues, you know. Um, yeah. They didn't have the internet. <laughs> exactly right. All of a sudden, like these people are attacking you. It's like what the hell, <laughs> you know? Like what did I do? I don't know what I did. <laughs> um, so you can see, like again, the empathy, like you know, empathy going into other people's heads. What might have been going on? And I I always find that fascinating with history. What was this other person thinking? Um, you know, cause there's always multiple views. Um, it's never like just one pure side. There's always different perspectives. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway. um, yeah, I sort of, it, 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 I do want us to have, do we have a guest coming up who's going to, um, help us look at unconscious bias and, and kind of the, the things we don't see no. in our no, world? No, not any, not in the next, um, two months. Okay. We should, we should, we can, we should, yeah, we should, we should look yeah. So if anyone okay. listening here knows of anyone who wants to come and, and talk with us about yeah. unconscious bias, that would be awesome because yeah. I, I, I'm beginning to see that that's kind of the root of all evil <laughs> in terms of, you know, the kind of issues that we're talking about here, but also, you know, how people succeed or don't succeed in the workplace. Right. Um, you know, even our ability to communicate with others and have empathy for others like you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of it gets lost in unconscious bias and, and assumptions that we make and don't challenge in ourselves. That's true. That's true. Yeah, you so, never you never know. That's where I always look back at history. I'm like, you never know. You never know what was going through these people's heads. Let's try to let's guess. That's probably one of my, <laughs> that's probably one of my personal favorite uh, uh, types of fiction is historical fiction. Yeah. Because let's yeah. people, you know, because there's an author who's trying to knit together pieces that, you know, weren't necessarily covered in the history books in a way that makes sense to us as human beings. Um, unfortunately, we can start believing that is the version of history, which why not? <laughs> well, what is it? The, the, when the movie um, Elizabeth came out, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you remember that um, with the... Uh, um, Kate Blanchett, I think it was her. Um, this was like eight A's, eons ago. Uh, um, and I remember when it came up, so I was working in this, um, and I was an intern at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. I was working with the film program. And so I'm helping them get do this like premiere thing, like they were doing a sneak preview, some jazz, right? And um, the film director, at, film program director asked me what I thought of the movie. And I'm like, oh, you know, there's some 
gaps in the history. History was wrong. Okay. It was downright wrong. <laughs> and I'm like, I don't think that happened that way. And he was so funny because he said the history according to Vogue. <laughs> That's interesting. He, he goes, if Vogue had a right, <laughs> Elizabeth's history, this would probably have been it. <laughs> like, that's fair. Sorry, Vogue. But anyway. <laughs> that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of like what you're saying. Like, you, it's it's in someone's head. It's an imagination. Yeah, it's fiction. Right. Could be true. And we can make it much more interesting than reality sometimes. <laughs> hey, you know, and then put some, put some, put some, you know inaccurate orderings and factoids in there. And there you go. <laughs> you got a movie. <laughs> Just put George Clooney in it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, we're over our 30 minutes. This was fun. <laughs> for anyone listening in live or on the recording, uh, please join us for our upcoming events at coffeebreak.empowercoaching.com. And uh, we will see you next Tuesday at 1 o'clock. Thank you again, Mary. It was a pleasure and fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Have a good one. You too. Bye.